Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us on this uh, last of our series of Lenten meals. And uh, man, I thought that pasta and uh, that um, garlic bread was delicious. So that was by our mission and the fellowship committee. So we're really just thankful for them to hosting that tonight. And so now let us uh, stand as we join together in our call to worship. You are my lamp, O Lord. God lightens my darkness. God is my strong refuge and has made my way safe. At the close of the day, Lord, be with us. Fill us with your life. And now we'll be singing the hymn every time I feel the spirit, number 481. And now let's join together in the prayer of the people, which is found in your bulletin sheet. Heavenly Father, be with us in every experience of life. When we neglect you, remind us of your presence. When we are frightened, give us courage. When we are tempted, give us power to resist. When we are anxious and worried, give us peace. When we are weary in service, give us energy and zeal. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated, and I'd like to invite forward our sunshine singers for this time of our special music. This series on the Lord's Prayer is if you've noticed throughout our services, we've been able to experience it in different ways. We've heard it through a clarinet uh, solo, we've heard it through vocal solos, we've had uh, everyone share and sing it together out loud. And so it's just so wonderful to hear these different uh, iterations of it, and just as it helps to permeate our hearts during this time. And so we're now going to hear the Sunshine Singers do it.
Thank you. And now our children and youth are dismissed. Uh, we're going to be going in the back for our own time of study. Great job. Let's give our kids another round of applause and Emma leading them. One of the neat things about our series is that we've been able to find about a half dozen different musical presentations of the Lord's Prayer um, that we have heard from the youth. We've heard them uh, on the clarinets. We'll be singing them on Sunday. And so it is just a wonderful reminder of the, the presence and the blessing of this prayer. Um, and tonight we will be focusing on uh, the idea of leading us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And that is the, the passage, or at least the, the petition of the prayer that we will focus on tonight. And as an opening scripture, I want to read from Ephesians 6, verses uh, 11 through 17. It's on page 195 of the Pew Bibles in front of you. So I encourage you to open up to that. And this is, as a, um, an introduction, uh, this is our summer series that we're going to be pursuing, is putting on the armor of God and doing so in a way that um, uplifts our Lord and uplifts and strengthens us. And so today it's focused on that idea of God preventing us from uh, being led into temptation and avoiding the evil that is in front of us. So let us hear from this uh, a famous piece of uh, scripture. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, Put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We thank God for his word this evening. And so as we prepare to hear this uh, second to the final installation of our series, The Lord's Prayer, I do want to remind you that Sunday we'll be listening to the final one following us, our service, um, and it'll be here in the sanctuary at 11 o'clock. We encourage you to come to, to hear the final um, video on the, the last petition in the Lord's Prayer. So let us now enjoy... Um, uh, Adam Hamilton tonight as we focus on leading is not into temptation. Well, it's great to be with you again today. This is session five. And this is actually, our petition today is where the Lord's Prayer ended in Matthew's Gospel. It was after the writing of the Gospel of Matthew in early versions, probably late first century, early second century, that we have the doxology added, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. But instead, the, God, the uh, prayer actually ended with Jesus inviting us to pray for God to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So when we come to this line in the, in the prayer, we've already prayed, and let's say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right, and we'll stop there. So, uh, first of all, we introduce the end. I really never paid much attention to the end. And so, in fact, I used to kind of leave them out. Like, I would pray, uh, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, lead us not into temptation. I left out the ends. I thought, well, first of all, they're redundant. You have an end, and then you have another end right after that. And it sounds like there's too many in there, and I wasn't really sure why they were there. But and in Greek, chi, is a conjunction. It, it brings together two phrases. And so it's intentionally there. And the first time it's there is after we pray uh, for our daily bread, which, we, as we learned, is also about praying for other people's <coughs> daily bread and meeting their needs, immediately after that we pray and forgive us our trespasses. Are those two things linked together? And it's possible that we have to ask for forgiveness in part because we didn't pay attention to the people who needed us in the prior line in the prayer. Now, we prayed, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and, and lead us not into temptation. It's, not, it's, it's one thing just simply to ask for forgiveness, but real repentance is choosing not to do the same thing over again. So these two lines really go hand in hand. I've asked for forgiveness and I want you to lead me. Now, this takes us all the way back to the beginning of the prayer where we pray for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done. And so as we think about those things, we've yielded ourselves to God. But here, what we recognize is we wouldn't have to pray this if we weren't sometimes tempted. And not just tempted, but if we didn't sometimes succumb to temptation, right? And here's news. All of us succumb to temptation. So, you know, it's easy to talk about some kinds of temptation. Like, it's easy to talk about temptation to eat. So I'll just talk about that one. So uh, in Kansas City, we have a donut shop. I'm guessing many of you do, too. And I really like donuts a lot. I don't eat them very often anymore. But we have a donut shop, uh, Krispy Kreme. Now, I don't think they're the best donuts in the whole world. Like, like, the only ones that I really love are the ones that are hot, the glazed donuts, and they have a sign. Do they have these in, in Tennessee, too? Yeah, the sign lights up hot now. And so years ago, I was, I was addicted to these things. And, uh, and I would, you know, I'd drive past. There was one in Kansas City, not that far from where I live. And I would drive past to see, wherever I was going, is the hot now sign? Because it was sort of like a deal. Like, God, if the hot now sign is on, I know you want me to go eat <laughs> Krispy Kreme donuts. And the deal about them when they're hot, they like melt in your mouth. And so one time I ate 10 in one sitting. Now I felt sick to my stomach after that, but it was like they were so good I couldn't stop. And so, you know, I remember one time I was driving by, I was really hoping the sign would be on, and the sign wasn't on. And so I drove around the corner, went around the block once, two times I went around the block but to see if maybe the sign would come back on. Did not come back on, and I skipped it. But, you know, that's kind of how we are, right? We find ourselves drawn to things, and it's not that there's something terribly wrong about having a Krispy Kreme donut. One is fine. Ten is not okay. And, uh, and so somewhere along the way, we, you know, we find ourselves needing to say, hey, maybe I shouldn't do that. Now, that's a simple one to talk about. There's a whole lot of other temptations that are much more dangerous. Relationships that we shouldn't be having with people we shouldn't have them with. Or a myriad of things. I mean, as a pastor, I've been around long enough to be with a whole lot of people who've made some really bad decisions. And uh, stealing, uh, cheating, um, you know, dishonesty, I mean, just a whole lot of things that people have struggled with and that they gave into, and they knew it was wrong when they did it, but somehow they had rationalized it. Now, I want us to recognize here what we're praying is uh, God lead us not into temptation. Now, the way we normally pray this prayer is lead us not into temptation, comma, but deliver us from evil. And what you've heard me pray is lead us, comma, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And I picked up on that about 35 or 40 years ago. I have no idea what commentator said it. I haven't been able to find you know, who it was. But, but the idea was when we normally pray, lead us not into temptation, it sounds like God does lead us into temptation, and we're asking God not to do that. And the question is, does God lead us into temptation? And if God does ever lead us into temptation, then there must be some good reason for it. So why would we tell him not to do what he has a good reason for doing? So the word temptation can be testing. And sometimes people will say, well, this is really about lead us not into testing. Well, wait, it's still the same thing. Like if God wants to lead me into testing, who am I to tell God not to do that? So I'm not trying to advise God on how to do God's job. But what I do think is that testing or temptation in this sense, that Jesus was led by the spirit to be tested or tempted in the wilderness. That was an important part of his ministry and and forging and shaping in him a determination and a testing of his resolve. And there may be times where testing works that way in our lives, but I think when it comes to temptation, God isn't in the business of trying to lead us or woo us to do the wrong thing. God is primarily in the business of trying to woo us through the spirit to do the right thing. 
So James writes these words. You've heard them before. James 1.13. Uh, and he says this. No one should say, no one who is tested should say, and again, tested and tempted are the same Greek word. No one who's tempted or tested should say, God is tempting me. This is because God is not tempted by any form of evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And I think James was right when he said that. And so I don't think God is tricking us or trying to, you know, trying to see, you know, how far he can lead us before we go astray. And there's a reason why in the scripture the devil's called the tempter. So I think that's the devil's job. He's testing us. And whether you see the devil as a literal, you know, being, or you see the devil as a, as a personification of the dark side that's in all of us, either way you find temptation comes on the dark side, and on the light side it's trying to lead us in the right path. And so when we come to this prayer, I think we move the comma, because in the Greek there were no commas in the ancient Greek. So uh, whether it was lead us not into temptation, comma, or lead us not into comma, not into temptation, we don't know. But what we do know is that it's highly unlikely that God is in the business of leading us into temptation. So lead us. That's what we're praying. Lead us. Comma, not into temptation the way I would lead myself or the way the tempter would lead me. So in essence, I'm not thinking God is tempting me. I'm thinking, God, I need your help. I want you to lead me. I am yielding myself to you. I want to follow you. To be a Christian is to be a follower of Christ, to be a disciple. Jesus called people. He said, come and follow me. And so what we're aiming to do is follow him. And what we don't want to do is follow temptation. So when I pray this prayer, it's always lead me. Lord, lead me, lead me. I want to return to the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And this is such a you know, compelling story, archetypal story about how we all are. And you know, they come to, and it's, nothing says it's an apple, but there's some kind of fruit on the tree. And it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, I don't want you to have that. And we miss the point when we try to figure out, why didn't God want them to have that tree? Or what is the tree of knowledge good and evil all about anyway? The point was that there was something that wasn't theirs. And there was a certain knowledge and a certain, you know, and, and if they had it, it would bring harm to them, which is really how sin works, right? So I just remind you, when we talk about sin, that we're talking about, you know, a path we're supposed to go on and the fact that we sometimes stray, right? And when we stray, we're moving ourselves further away from Christ not towards Christ. And often that brings pain. And so Adam and Eve, you know, are, are tempted by a particular piece of fruit. And you remember how that works. You're told, don't do something, and then you find yourself wanting to do it. And that's what happens with Adam and Eve. And so what they hear is the voice of the tempter saying, you know, doesn't that fruit look good? Smell it. Oh, man, it's so ripe. It's going to be the best fruit you ever ate if you'll just eat it. And in that moment, you know, we're no longer thinking about consequences. We're no longer thinking about what might happen if we do that. All we can think of is the pleasure we're going to derive from this thing. And most often, if it's something pretty bad, we find pretty quickly we feel ashamed and guilty and unclean and dirty and wish we hadn't done this thing. And that's life. I mean, that's universal. That's why it's in Scripture. That's why we read these stories. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? And what, we're, what Jesus is saying is here, when you pray, you're training your heart. You're tuning your heart to focus on the thing you're praying for. You become what you pray, right? And so when we're praying, lead me, we become that the more we pray, not into temptation. We remember, and the more we pray not into temptation, we find that we, that we are less inclined to go in that direction of the temptation. That's the power of this prayer. So I was thinking about something Walter Langeren says. He was a Lutheran pastor, retired now. I think he was in Detroit. And uh, one of his books was called That's For Me and My House. And in it, he talked about his relationship with his wife. <clears throat> and then he talked about, as in ministry, the number of people he'd seen who had cheated on their spouses. And he said, uh, what I've noticed is there's a moment of the maybe. And the moment of the maybe is the place where we play with the idea. And it may be cheating. It may be something totally different. But we play with the idea for a while. Like, I wonder what, I'm not going to do it, but I just wonder what it'd be like. Or playing with the fantasy of it for a little while. And in the midst of doing that, he says, it's not far from maybe to yes. You open the door just a little bit, and you play with it for a while. And, and really sin, and James says it, sin begins in the heart. It begins with the idea that we conceive. And eventually, it, it does conceive, and it gives birth. But it starts with our thought lives. And so when we're praying, we're changing our thought patterns. And we're praying <clears throat> for God to lead us, and not into temptation. So again, we're asking God to lead us. All right, so this seems like a pretty personal prayer. Uh, lead us, not into, lead us, like lead me, not to Krispy Kreme. But it's us, lead us. And, and I think that's important here because it's about how not only we struggle individually, 
but how societies and groups of people struggle with sin. And then you look back at our own history as a country, you know, whether it's Jim Crow or the KKK, or you, know, you go all the way through and you see anti-Semitism and you see uh, injustice, racial injustice, you see the pain that we've caused each other. And you think, okay, how does that happen with a nation that purports to be largely Christian? And you know, we see that today in the rise of white nationalism and a whole host of other things that have happened. You know, injustice when it comes to policing and, and other things where we look at this and just say, how easy it is for us to rationalize taking a bite of the apple, whatever the apple might be. How easy it is for us to, to justify mistreating other human beings or as a society, you know, and for many of us, it's not that we don't see the wrong, it's just that we're afraid to say anything. But our silence in the face of injustice in humanity is participation. So I remember talking to a man who was from uh, Rwanda. He was a Hutu from Rwanda, and he was describing in 1994, of course, the genocide in Rwanda. And he said in his church, there were both Hutu and Tutsi. And he said, we sang in the choir, uh, Hutu and Tutsi. And he said, at the same time, we had government officials and people who were whispering on the radio stations, not whispering, but talking on the radio stations in dehumanizing language about the Tutsi. And, uh, and, and as that continued over time, there is something inside of you that begins to look at the Tutsi with fear or disgust. Now you're a church member, so you're gonna still sing together in the choir. But there was something that changed. And he said on the day when the, when the machetes came out, he said, it was like we were in a fog. Like I, I couldn't visualize what I was actually doing and what we were doing to the people around us. And I can't explain it still. And you think, how does that happen to Christian people? And how do we avoid it? So part of what we have to recognize is that, is that this part of the prayer isn't simply about not eating Krispy Kreme donuts. It's about looking at human beings as human beings and not dehumanizing people. It, it's about making sure that we're responding with love and grace and not hurt and hate. And somewhere in there finding the courage to be able to say, help me, Lord, not only to not be led into temptation and to resist the evil one, but to be able to speak up against it. That's hard, but that's part of, I think, what we're called to do based on this passage. All right, so Matthew has, uh, it, when he says, uh, deliver us, the word is Ryanai, which is where we have the English word rush. Deliver me is, in essence, God rushed to my side and save me, rescue me from the person I might be or the things I might do. Rescue me, save me from the evil. That's what we're praying here. So we always have a choice. We can smell it. We can look at how beautiful it is. We can rationalize it and we can... Nah. I think I'll save that for another day. And we can say, lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is indeed the challenge for us as we pray this prayer, internalizing it, realizing that we want God to lead us over the temptation and the evil that is out there, but also that we are collectively doing it as a voice and as a body. So let this church be a church that rises above the temptations that the world throws at us. Let us be the ones that are the voice of love and grace and mercy rather than, like he said, hurt and hate. And that starts within, but it flows throughout all that we are and all that we do. And so let us vow together to be the ones that will stand up against the injustices of the world, the sin that we see, um, and to speak out loudly uh, with the grace and mercy of our Lord. Amen? Amen. Well, let us stand now to sing that wonderful hymn, Jesus Walked That Lonesome Valley, number 254.
Lord Jesus, we praise you that you are the one that had to walk in that valley. You walked it for me. You walked it for us. Lord, we know that we cannot walk it. It is you and you alone. Because only you does the victory come. You have lived a perfect, sinless life. and Because of that, you went to the cross for our sins and our imperfections. So, Lord Jesus, let us feel your strength. Let us feel your love this Lenten season as we prepare to walk with you towards the cross of victory, the cross of salvation, the redemption that we find only in you. Lord Jesus, it is in your name that we pray. Amen. And I do want to remind and invite all of you to participate in our Easter week, the Holy Week that is coming up. This Sunday, we will stand triumphantly as our children walk up and down the aisles waving palms, and we will speak to the glory of our God. Wednesday, we will gather at the Symbolic Supper at noon to reenact the Seder meal that Christ had with his disciples. Thursday, we will be in the upper room with our God, enjoying the Lord's Supper, communion. Saturday, we will celebrate with the church as we invite people in to hear the message of Christ. And then Sunday, we will gather together and we will proclaim that He has risen. He is risen indeed. So I encourage you to come. I encourage you to invite friends and family so that all can hear this message and all may know of the victory that God gives. Amen? All right. Thank you. Have a great evening. It looks like there's some things in the back we can purchase if you'd like. Thank you.